வணக்கம் நேர்களே இது வெளிச்சம் இன்றைய வெளிச்சத்தில் முன்னாள் ஐரோப்பிய பாராளுமன்ற பிரதிநிதி திரு ராபர்ட் எவன்ஸ் அவர்களும் எமது நாடாளுமன்ற நாடு கடந்த தமிழீழ அரசின் சபாநாயகர் திரு பொன் பாராஜன் அவர்களும் கலந்து கொள்கின்றார்கள் ஒருவர் <laughs> you have been seen as a friend of tamils mm. uh, in that uh, way that you have visited sri lanka july 2008 was the last visit i believe mm. and um, what is your assessment of what was happening at that time well thank you wanakum and mm. i'm very pleased and very proud to be considered a, a friend of the tamils and of the tamil people uh my recollections of the visit in in 2008 was in july 2008 it was certainly a, an interesting time and the government and the president was very tense mm. and it was a troubled visit because uh the government of sri lanka were very anxious to showcase the visiting members of the european parliament and try and use us for political propaganda purposes and i and my colleagues didn't wish to be used in that mm. way um i don't think then looking back now nearly well over over four years i don't think we sensed then that it was quite such a pivotal moment and and then that within just a few months of that there would be the the violent um government onslaught on the tamil people so it was a more or less a guided tour and then you were shown what uh, you wanted to be shown that's it and then you didn't go did you go to uh, klinochi or uh, any other places uh, no as i recall we didn't on that we were supposed to be going to batakaloa mm. but we didn't go there as i recall we stayed in colombo i'm i my memory is such because i've made a number of visits to sri lanka but i don't believe on that one we did go anywhere else um and we actually went down to gaul in the end mm. but that was only after the visit to uh, batakaloa had been postponed for a variety oh. of reasons yeah that's the time that you refused to uh, mm. shake yeah. hands with the player well yes we yeah. were we were going to go the visit got cut shorter there were all sorts of shenanigans things happening stories going round we were at the airport waiting for a plane to go uh and then the plane didn't materialize um we were supposed to be going for 2 days and then it was going to be cut short so um the visit was aborted um mm. which i was very pleased that we weren't going to be used as as propaganda there but it did have repercussions that went on for a long time afterwards so um between 2008 and 2009 after the mulivai kali incident were you surprised uh, in any way that uh, this massive onslaught to this catastrophe was uh, was forthcoming and it was riding on the wall i was surprised because i didn't believe that the sri lankan government could be the, the sri lankan government who consistently had spoken about one island one country one people uh, that the tamil people were as much part of sri lanka as the sinhalese or the muslims or anybody else who lived there i could not believe that any government would have such a vicious and violent onslaught against its own people mm-hmm. and all the evidence then and now is that it wasn't just a military campaign it wasn't just soldiers of the government fighting against the military wing of the ltte we know mm-hmm. that there were civilians being involved the government knew that civilian targets were in their line mm-hmm. and the consistent and almost verifiable evidence is that the government were deliberately targeting hospitals so they knew that civilians were going to be hurt and injured and that the government now must take huge responsibility for the number of casualties and civilian casualties but uh uh when you came back 
mm. to Europe. The very first thing that I think you gave an in, uh, interview with to the uh, independent newspaper or something, mm. right? Or the mm. European article or whatever. You mentioned clearly you uh, warned uh, to the UN to get uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, for the intervention of the UN mm -hmm. or uh, international community to start, stop mm -hmm. this, uh, what, what you've mm -hmm. seen, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the oncoming massacre. But uh, none of them were, uh, were taking any keen interest or interest mm -hmm. at all. What, what do you think, uh, what, what was the reason? Because they were able to do the same thing in Libya and other mm -hmm. countries, yes. and, uh, but mm -hmm. not in Sri Lanka. Why? What, what was uh, in their mind? Well, I think that Sri Lanka was long uh, a situation of conflict that was put aside by the international community. It was a bit of an enigma, if you like, mm -hmm. in that um, the government, Sri Lanka is still a member of the Commonwealth, and I, I think a lot of the developed countries, a lot of the democracies in Europe and within the Commonwealth could not believe mm -hmm. that a country within the Commonwealth was going to behave so appallingly as it did. They could not believe that there was a civil war in one of the countries. And of course the government perpetrated this by continually telling the international community that there was no civil war, there mm. were no human rights abuses uh, in Sri Lanka, and that the government was behaving perfectly legitimately. Mm -hmm. um, so when there was a contrary side to that, when it was clear to anybody who'd looked at Sri Lanka, anyone who'd investigated what was going on, mm -hmm. that the situation was not as the government were portraying. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't predict the onslaught and the violent end to it, but I couldn't see um, how there was going to be a, a military solution that was going to be satisfactory to both sides, or even as a compromise, which was why I was calling repeatedly mm -hmm. for the UN to uh, if not send in troops, to send in monitors to see yeah. mm -hmm. uh, what was going on, to look at the human rights, uh, the allegations of human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. And I think it's to the enormous detriment and shame of the UN that they did nothing Thanks about it. Uh, Mr. Balrajan, on the, on the same token, uh, what, did, what, what is your assessment of whether the UN had miserably failed in, uh, in, in, uh, in taking the right action at the right time? or uh, were they hand handcuffed by the international community for one reason or another? Actually, uh, in my point of view, uh, UN not even tried to fail, because uh, there is no any evidence that UN have tried to stop this carnage of uh, Tamils in Sri Lanka. They never did. So there is no failure in, the, in their effort. They, they, it didn't happen. In the other thing, uh, the, the, the Security Council, and um, they are very much uh, the friend, friendly with the Sri Lanka, even higher officials in the UN, and uh, we know a couple of names too. They are very much uh, friendly with the, um, uh, Sri Lanka. So it is very difficult for UN to go against uh, Sri Lanka. But uh, very recently, uh, the, one of the journalists uh, mentioned uh, um, UN just take a newspaper article and pass it to them. This is came in the newspaper. That is the level of uh, engagement UN had with the Sri Lankan government. That is number one. Number two, there is a fear on the um, a very genuine um, diplomats or UN diplomats because Sri Lanka uh, will start attacking them personally mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, you know, it's a kind of uh, diplomatic bullying. Mm -hmm. So people are feared about that because... Mm -hmm. Like they have been accusing uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. of uh, Mr. Uh, getting uh, bribes from uh, LTTE mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, taking orders from Klinachi and whatever, yeah, right? So th that's the way they, they even uh, Navanidhan Pillai was accused. Yeah. And uh, uh, everybody who tried to help resolve this issue, not mm -hmm. to help Tamil people, mm -hmm. they want to help this resolve this issue, they were targeted by Sri Lankan uh, media, Sri Lankan diplomat, uh, they attack them, uh, they... Uh, they brush them with... Uh, yes, yeah. so uh, because of that, why uh, a journalist should go through that, uh, journalist or diplomat, go through that extent <laughs> to help Tamil people, there is no <coughs> any geopolitical interest on these people. So, but that is uh, another reason. There are mm. two reasons, because uh, UN is a kind of uh, organization which uh, uh, big people, they have a party with them. Uh, <coughs> while you were there, uh, you were able to see the Tamil masses, right, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in some areas, or at least from media reports and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. There has been an uh, accusation by the government mm -hmm. and uh, people who are opposed to tigers, even the Tamils, uh, among Tamils, 
the Tamil masses were herded by LTTE from, from Klinoji towards uh, the end, mm. knowingly that they have been uh, going into a death trap. <coughs> the Tamil people, from a, from a third uh, person's uh, perspective, <coughs> Do you believe that they willingly followed them or they were forced or their resiliency and that overconfidence in the tiger's ability to save them? What uh, do, do you think that would have been the reason for why they followed in such a mm. manner? Well, I think it's a combination of factors. But if you put yourself in the position of an ordinary Tamil family living in that part of the valley, what were their alternatives? What were their alternatives? You know, the suggestions that they would they have wanted to go and surrender to the Sinhalese government troops? Well, uh, that would you know, they they didn't speak the same language. They had for years they'd had fear of um, <coughs> the government troops, uh, and these were the same soldiers that had been bombarding them and shooting them uh, over many months. So there would have been that fear. It wasn't as easy as all that to. Um, surrender and the history of the world is that surrendering civilians have not always been treated uh, as well as we'd like to think that they would have been. Mm -hmm. I think also there's considerable evidence that um, the, uh, the, the Tamil people there in the LTT believed that they were in certain parts in safe havens that they weren't going to be bombed and they were told that and the international community was told there were safe zones where they could go. Now we all know now that the government troops didn't respect those safe troops, the safe zones, or the troops were not following strict orders. That whatever was being agreed in Colombo was not being relayed to the troops, and it wouldn't be the first case of uh, military regiments going against what a government wanted. But I think it was a, a combination of all of those. Their, uh, if not loyalty, but their involvement with their leaders and the people who'd been um, controlling them certainly for months and years meant they were not really in a position to do very much else um, and if again you look in and I'm not an expert on military conflicts but there weren't many people when invading armies come to their part of the world who mm. decide to go in a different direction mm. and if they had, had surrendered they probably were, were fearful of what have happened might have happened then but uh, that's that was the argument uh, they they put the government uh, put forward to the united nations or anyone else that uh, we are doing this operation to liberate the people right and mm. then in in the name of liberation mm. they killed so many right mm. so uh, now that uh, there's well, yes, a yeah, I travel, you see, I would, the other side to that is I travelled through the Varni when it was under the control of the LTTE to mm -hmm. Kilinochi and all the other places. Mm -hmm. Now, I may be very naive, I may be very stupid, mm -hmm. but there was no evidence to me at that time that the ordinary people mm -hmm. felt um, they threatened. were being they threatened, not at all. There were LTT police, schools, you know, uh, the society was continuing and progressing and they were getting supplies from... Mm -hmm. Um, Kilinochi, from in Kilinochi from mm. Colombo. Um, government was still having government agencies, they were still providing funds. So it was a rather false situation. It's it, almost like a de facto state at that it, well, time. It was a de facto uh, state yeah, and yeah. it was one that was accepted by Colombo because mm. they didn't have a blockade. Mm -hmm. They didn't yeah. stop all the supplies going in there. Mm -hmm. So they were humane in that sense that mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. kept things going. And there was, as I say, the, the it did not seem to me that there were people at that time, and I can't remember when it was I'm referring to going through there, that people were living on edge mm -hmm. or that all the people were feeling this was not a situation that they wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, and you get the same in other parts of the world. In Cuba, people saying, well, the ordinary people don't like it, they're feeling suppressed. Well, if you talk to the ordinary people, a lot of them are happy with what's going on. Many may not be, but a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. And there was n not, to me, a distinct view in those parts of the Varni in the days when it was under LTT control that people um, were not content, happy or even accepting, perhaps even at the very best, they were just accepting yeah. what was going on. Okay. <coughs> there was a controversy recently, uh, I think uh, during the, um, the Francis Harrison's book launch in England, uh, the speech that was made by um, Eric Solheim. He believes that uh, uh, had the senior leaders accepted uh, <clears throat> the proposal that put, put forward by the um, international community vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, Norway. 
by surrendering, the senior leaders uh, surrendering and then uh, people uh, will be allowed to <coughs> uh, go free and uh, only the Potaman and Talavar uh, Prabhakaran uh, would be arrested and, and dealt with, whatever. Uh, so by that, you could have saved thousands and thousands of lives. Uh, so what do you think that, that statement is? Uh, is there a validity, validity to it? Uh, before we comment about that statement, uh, actually we don't know, I don't know the full text of his speech. I, I know the, the, your reference to that particular statement, uh, the last days uh, LTT leadership should, uh, leadership should have um, surrendered, so it, that way they, can s they would have saved uh, uh, thousands of uh, civilians. But uh, it is a, the other issue uh, under this one is um, the at on what condition they are going to get surrendered. But uh, because we need to think the LTT clearly they knew how brutal Sri Lanka mm. uh, army and the government and mm. uh, their whole infrastructure uh, about uh, Tamil people and LTTE. They clearly they very well knew what is go what will happen. Even they surrender, this carnage will go on for a for few more weeks and uh, then uh, then they can tell the international community this would have happened. But this is simple example. Mm -hmm. After uh, um, na uh, political wing leader Nadeshan and uh, Peace Secret Secretariat um, Pulitavan, Pulitavan. So during their surrender, uh, you remember, you know what has happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were slaughtered. Mm -hmm. So this is the attitude of Sri Lankan government because mm -hmm. that is the estimate of from LTT side what will happen mm -hmm. what you said. Okay, yeah. that is proof. Okay, no one, okay. one more one more point yeah. I wanted to bring. Mm -hmm. And so how the, it can be avoided? Mm -hmm. This uh, the, they are, they are going to lose uh, so to protect <coughs> the civilians and uh, those the carders those who are going to surrender. Mm -hmm. So LTT uh, requested they need to have an international mm -hmm. international uh, representative for yeah. example mm -hmm. Red Cross. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have uh, that kind of mm -hmm. arrangement, mm -hmm. but Sri Lanka government uh, rejected. So they want them to surrender straight to the army. Mm -hmm. Same thing mm -hmm. what uh, Pulitavan and uh, Nadesan did. Mm -hmm. So, so without any <coughs> any guarantee from international community, mm -hmm. the surrendering uh, is is a very questionable because the Sri Lankan army behavior and our experience with the Sri Lankan mm -hmm. army and the government. Um, you know, it is same yeah. uh, results. It's going yeah, to but be. the thing is that uh, maybe uh, Mr. Evans mm -hmm. can answer this. Uh, the, uh, knowing the psyche of uh, the LTT mm. uh, from uh, the Norwegian side, uh, you know, they have been to Vani mm. several times, uh, mm. uh, and then knowing what uh, they would say in in terms of uh, the surrendering process, whatever. Why would they insist? What, why would uh, Eric Solheim insist that you know, had they surrendered, we would have been alive, and the people would have been saved, mm. and whatever? The Sri Lanka's behavior is also very predictable to the international community, right? And it's not, mm. it's been happening for the past mm. 60 years, right? So well, it's in a hypothesis, uh, and I've met uh, Eric Solheim, and I was at the book launch with Francis Harrison in London, and I, I, I saw and spoke with Mr. Solheim then, and I'd been to Norway to, to, to speak with him. Um, it's it's an impossible, you know, and I, I respect Eric Soltheim enormously, mm -hmm. but uh, it's an impossible hypothesis to verify one way or the other. Had Prabhakaran and the other major leaders surrendered, is there any evidence that they would have been treated with respect, dignity, or even any sort of humani humanity or dignity? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you've only got to look at the precedents. You know, Saddam Hussein, when he was found by, the, the, wow. you know, he wasn't exactly mm -hmm. treated um, well. We, you know, we're looking at other internet. You know, um, uh, Sim bin Laden. Well, mm -hmm. he was eliminated. Um, yeah, I'm whether the, you know, could we really say that we think that the uh, Sri Lankan military would have said, "Thank mm -hmm. you very much for coming over quietly, Mr. Prabhakaran." sit down and we'll treat you as a proper prisoner of war uh, and deal with you in a humane, civilized way in terms of the, um, you know, the International Court, International Geneva, Con Geneva Convention. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure that that, with, that could have happened. Um, mm. One would like to think that that was possible and the Sri Lankan government would have been dignified and mature enough, but I don't think there's any evidence when you see what they, in the absence of that surrender, what mm. they did to um, not just the 
LTT military, but to the civilians. And mm. there's you know, consistent and considerable evidence that of this m mass slaughter of mm. civilians. So uh, the humane side to the Sri Lankan military doesn't, doesn't actually win me over. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, uh, the role of uh, Norwegians, uh, mm. and recently after this, specifically after Eric Solheim's uh, this uh, <coughs> announcement in the book launch, or perceived mm. uh, his opinion, there is uh, opinion in, among the Tamil diaspora that uh, Norway has uh, betrayed us in big time. Right, and uh, they have been uh, bringing in evidences from other efforts by Novi in terms of peace talks, like with NPA from uh, Philippines, uh, New People's Army, uh, their demise, and the Palestinian Liber Liberation Organization's um, uh, effort to win peace, uh, and the intervention by the Norwegians, and that, that failed. Uh, so, um, and their involvement in the Tamil issue was also kind of predisposed, pre, uh, with a, came with a pre-agenda mm -hmm. uh, in order to destroy the, the Tamil's uh, quest for uh, liberation, whatever. No, well, I, I, I don't buy that argument at all. Mm -hmm. I think the, the Tamils in Sri Lanka have been badly let down, as we've heard earlier on from my mm -hmm. friend here, mm -hmm. early le uh, badly let down by the United Nations, by the Commonwealth, uh, by all the rest of the international community who effectively stood by uh, and allowed the slaughter to happen by not putting immense pressure on the Sri Lankan government, on President Rajapaksa, by not insisting that there were going to be... You know, if the UN had said, we are going to bring over, if not UN troops, but uh, UN observers, monitoring, yeah. um, monitors, mm. unarmed, if you like, we're going to bring those people over, uh, would the Sri Lankan government have refused the plain the um, permission to land at Colombo, I'm, we don't know, but at least they could have tried and they didn't try. Um, the, the Commonwealth, I think the failure of the Commonwealth as well for a, a mm. one of its member states is, is quite appalling. Mm. So it's then very easy to criticise the one country, if you like, Norway, that was really making concerted efforts. But they were trying, and I do believe the honesty and integrity of them, they were trying to come up with a solution that would have been a democratic solution whereby um, the Tamil people would have had land, would have had rights, would have had the opportunity to vote and for self-determination of some sort as we don't yet, you know, we don't know what it would have been now. Um, so, uh, you know, that was a possibility. That is now further away as a result of the Mm -hmm. the military conquest in 2009 and the have many thousands of deaths uh, mm -hmm. you know that's a lot further away now so uh, that's the way the history has gone but I think the real failure is on the part of the UN uh, Commonwealth India you know the mm -hmm. whole international well, yeah, that, community. That was, uh, again my next question was uh, what, what do you think of the India's role uh, pre and post like um, mm -hmm. I know they have their uh, their um, trouble with uh, Rajiv Gandhi's assa um, yes. assassination and mm. uh, what follows that as mm. well. But uh, was there anything else uh, to uh, for them to uh, go against in such a manner uh, against the uh, LTTE, apart from the LTTE, mm. uh, apart from the uh, Rajiv, Rajiv Gandhi's assassination, well, any well, other agenda? Well, of course, agenda? Uh, one can respect and understand why India were cross, wary, uh, that the whole um, the deep wounds and scars that the Rajiv Gandhi assassination had left on India. Mm -hmm. But by the mere geography of the nature of that part of the world, that part of South Asia, which you cannot change, mm -hmm. any solution for Sri Lanka was always going to have to have massive involvement on the part of India. The huge number of Tamils in Tamil Nadu, uh, but the geopolitics of the area, that the uh, uh, Sri Lanka is a very small country alongside a country of one billion people. And it's the same if you're looking at a solution for the Maldives or difficulties in Bangladesh, Nepal, any of the countries in that area. Um, it, I think it's essential that India is closely involved and on board and working mm. um, with the other countries, and particularly with the case of Sri Lanka. India uh, is a big player and will continue to be so. <coughs> uh, so uh, the, the role of uh, Tamil Nadu, people from Tamil Nadu, is also as, impo mm. is as important as uh, the diaspora, Tamil diaspora, mm. uh, how they have been handling these issues, uh, again, uh, mm. pre-Mulivaikal and, uh, and the post. Mm. 
Let's um, talk about it after a short break.